All right. Well, good morning, church. All right. Thank you for that. You know, a lot of times I'll say it and I'm like, okay. Did anybody hear what I just said? Okay. So thank you for that. Let's try one more time. Good morning, church. All right. What a great opportunity we have today to come into the house of the Lord. And just thank you for being here in person this morning. And for those of you that are watching either online or later today, thank you for joining in and, and being a part of our worship service today. Uh, my name's Jeff, and as always, it's an honor and it's a pleasure to be here just to sing through these songs and to lead through the songs. And, and uh, I just want to say this morning that maybe today is the day that we need to lay some of these burdens down. Amen? You know, this world puts a lot on us. Sometimes we find ourselves carrying around a heavy load. Well, I know somebody today that can help you take that load. Amen? And his name is Jesus. So it's my prayer today that if there are things that are weighing us down and there are things that are coming between our Savior and ourselves, I pray that today is the day we move those things out of the way and we leave those things at the foot of the cross today. Amen? All right, so if you will, let's stand together. We're going to ask the Lord to come be a part of what we do here. You know, we don't, we don't just stand up here and play songs just because, you know, not because that we like the songs, even though we might like them, but that's not the reason why we do it. We do it to usher in the Holy Spirit to prepare our hearts for the spoken word. So this morning, we're going to lift up the name of Jesus. We're going to declare who he is, and we're going to let the Holy Spirit know that he's welcome in this place today. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for this day, and thank you for all your blessings. Thank you for loving us and taking care of us, and thank you for this place we have to come and to worship you. God, it's my prayer this morning that we will be moved out of the way and get ourselves out of the way so that you can come and do what you do, which is convict us, which is cleanse us, and set us on the right path, God. So today, it's my prayer that the Holy Spirit would come and inhabit the praises of your people right here in this very room today. I pray for Brother Ryan as he brings the message this morning. I pray that you would just speak through him, give him exactly what he needs to say, and then give us the ears to listen and the will to apply it to our lives. And all these things I pray in Jesus' name, amen. You know, we find ourselves in a lot of things sometimes, and the darkness of this world can surround us. And that's what this song talks about. But there's a place that we can stand, and we can stand firm, and that's in the love of Jesus Christ. And Brian's going to help us out with this one this morning. If you will, just sing along, amen. <laughs> Darkness tries to roll over my bones. Sorrow comes to steal the joy out. Brokenness and pain is all I know. Oh, I won't be shaken. Oh, I won't be shaken. My feet doesn't stand a chance when I. Standing, your love, my feet doesn't stand a chance when I'm standing. 
all the honor and glory he deserves this morning.
Amen. You may be seated. It is such a great joy to see everybody here today. I hope that you've had a good weekend, and it is great to be in the presence of the Lord, worshiping Him for everything that He's done. God is good all the time, and all the time God is good. He's worthy of our praise, and I hope that your heart can just overflow with praise to Him, because He is certainly worthy of that. I do want to welcome everybody who's here. If you're a guest, thank you so much for being with us. You might have noticed in front of you that there is a card. If you don't mind to scan this top one, it will take you to a connection card, and we would be grateful if you filled that out for us. Thank you so much for worshiping with us. And for our members, we're grateful for you being here as well. Thank you for your prayers. Thank you for inviting friends and neighbors to worship with us. God is working and changing people's lives, and I'm excited to report that. And there are many, many good things coming in the coming weeks. And so we're looking forward to what God is going to continue to do in our midst. But let's go ahead and take this time and commit it over to Jesus and and pray at this time. So let's bow our heads and give it over to the Lord. Father, we come before you, and as we sung, God, your presence is what it's all about. And we just come before you knowing that in your presence there is fullness of joy. And I pray, God, that this would be a time where we would experience your joy, that you would fill our hearts with who you are. And I pray, God, that we would be obedient to whatever you would ask us to do. God, we're so looking forward to this time where we can hear from your word, and I pray that our heart would be attentive to whatever you would ask us to do. We ask, God, if there's someone here that doesn't know Jesus as their Savior, that today they would turn from their sin and turn to you, the only Savior, and that they would be saved. God, you are a good God all the time, and no matter what circumstances we're going through, we can lift up our hands knowing that you are faithful. We love you and pray that you would continue to receive our praise, and we pray all these things in the mighty name of Jesus, amen.
awesome God you are. Amen. We declare that this morning. And church, you may be seated. If you're a part of Children's Church, whether you're helping or whether you are attending that part of the service, if you guys will come forward and exit either to the right or to the left, and we will get you where you need to be. Thank you, church. Well, amen. If everybody will open their Bibles this morning to the book of 2 Timothy, chapter 1, verses 13 through 18 will be our sermon text in just a few moments. 2 Timothy, chapter 1. And as you're turning there, I had heard a story about a hunter who raised his rifle and took careful aim at a bear. And as he was about to pull the trigger and shoot the bear, the bear interrupted him and said, well, hold on, can we talk about this? Is there a way that we can compromise or negotiate here rather than you just shooting me and it being over? And so he asked the hunter, he said, well, what is it that you want? And he said, I would like a fur coat. And the bear said, well, I would like a full stomach. So how can we come to a compromise on this? And he said, the bear said to the hunter, he said, if I could come up with a compromise where you can get what you want and I can get what I want, would you be willing to accept it? And the hunter said, yeah, I think that that sounds great. Well, after that, the bear ate the hunter. The hunter, of course, had a fur coat now, and the bear had a full stomach. There may be things in life that we can compromise, and there are other things that we cannot compromise. Compromise is kind of like a sandwich. We meet in the middle, right? But today's text reminds us of things that we should never compromise on. So let's read together 2 Timothy chapter 1, starting in verse number 13. God's word says this, follow the pattern of the sound words that you have heard from me. In the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus, by the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, guard the good deposit entrusted to you. You are aware that all who are in Asia turned away from me, among whom are Phygelus and Hermogenes. May the Lord grant mercy to the household of Onesiphorus, for he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chains. But when he arrived in Rome, he searched for me earnestly and found me. May the Lord grant him to find mercy from the Lord on that day, and you well know all the service he rendered at Ephesus. Let's uh, go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we come before you, again, asking that you would just speak to us through your word. This is a time where we open our hearts to be able to be moved by your Holy Spirit. And God, you show us areas where we are struggling, areas where we have disobeyed you. And I pray when you do that, that we would confess our sin and cling to the promise that you cleanse us when we confess our sins. But God, we also see that you are an awesome and mighty God as we read your text today. And I pray, God, that our hearts would be turned to worship and praise, knowing that we're not here to serve ourselves, but we're here to exalt the greatest name in the planet, the King of kings and Lord of lords, Jesus Christ. And I pray today that he would be, above all, honored and glorified. We love you, and we just pray your anointing would be on me as I proclaim your word. As I believe your word has tremendous power, that it does not return void when it is proclaimed. And I pray, God, that you would just have your way with every heart. And I pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Paul had left Timothy in Ephesus, and he was there to appoint elders for the church to warn them about false teachers and to be ready in season and out of season to preach the word of God. And so what we see is, is that there is this Timothy that was being written to from a dark and damp prison, and Paul, with very little time left, wrote in the first seven verses of chapter one that you don't need to be fearful. God has not given you a spirit of fear, but of power and love and of a sound mind. And then last week we saw in verses 8 through 12 that Timothy should be unashamed of the gospel to make sure that he lived a life that was unashamed of anything that might come as a result of being obedient and proclaiming the gospel message. As I mentioned last week, 
Paul knew Jesus and knew that he was worth serving, worth giving his life for, and he encouraged Timothy to do the same thing. Today, we're going to see the importance of having uncompromising convictions. Many Christians today don't seem to understand why they believe what they believe. And because of this, they are susceptible to false teachers. You can turn on the internet and YouTube and get a plethora of all these false teachers telling you one thing and telling you another thing, and you don't really know what to believe if you are not grounded in the truth. And so today, we're going to see that the emphasis of Christianity is not so much what you believe, but it is about who you believe. As we saw in verse 12 when Paul said, I am not ashamed because I know whom I have believed in. And so for Paul, the foundation of his faith was not doctrines and all of these things you recite over and over again, but it's a person and it is the Lord Jesus Christ. If you see the beauty of Jesus the way that Paul saw him, you will be courageous and you will be unashamed to live your life for him. But if you look at your life and you continually see yourself cowering to fear, constantly being ashamed, constantly making excuses for your disobedience, it might be an indication that you don't have an uncompromising conviction. If you are fearful or ashamed, many times you're going to look for ways to compromise your faith in Christ. You're going to manage your faith in ways to protect your comforts, your conveniences, and also your reputation. But uncompromising faith is a total, unswerving commitment to God. It's not a light switch that you turn on and off based on convenience, or whenever you get scared, you turn off your faith. It's not something we hide in a bushel. No, we have to have a strong conviction in who we believe. And so today we're going to look at uncompromising convictions from this passage. And I'm going to give you three ways in which you can have an uncompromising conviction about your faith. And so let's just jump right into this. The first uncompromising conviction is found in verse 13. It is that we need to deepen our convictions about God's word. Deepen our convictions about God's word. If you don't stand for something, the old saying goes, you'll fall for anything. As Christians, we stand for the Bible. It is God's holy word. What we believe about the Bible lays the foundation for our faith. It is God's revelation of himself to us. And so when we disbelieve and disobey the Bible, we are disbelieving and disobeying God himself. The scriptures say in 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. That the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. And so as we approach the Bible, we understand that it is God-breathed, fully inspired. The Bible's not just merely one of many religious books. It is the authority of our life. Actually, it's the final authority of our lives. It is the compass that points us to life. And you might wonder, why do we need the Bible? And the Bible is necessary for us to know the gospel, for us to maintain a healthy spiritual life, and all, for us to know God's will for our lives. Without God's revelation in the word of God, we would not have those things. And so when our convictions about God's word is shaky, we will be quick to compromise. And we're going to be quick to make excuses for our disobedience. And Satan knows this. Satan's first words to humanity in Genesis chapter 3 verse 1 were these words. Did God really say? And that's what he wants you to do. He wants you to doubt whether or not God's word is really true. And so if you struggle with fear or being ashamed... I encourage you to look at how you approach God's word. Is it really your authority if it collects dust on the shelf? Is it really your compass if you haven't taken time to understand what is written in God's word? Genuine convictions always lead to action. And so today we're going to take some action and see what we can 
do to de deepen our convictions about the Bible. And so what this is going to do is this is going to help us develop greater faith in what God's Word says so that we can live unashamed lives and fearless lives no matter what might come in our way. So three ways to deepen our convictions about the Bible. Number one, we study the Scriptures. We study the Scriptures. You notice there in verse 13, Paul says to Timothy, follow the pattern of sound words that you have heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Now that first command there is the word follow. And the word follow could be translated to hold on or to grip. I don't know if you've ever had the opportunity to teach a child how to swing a baseball bat. But every team seems to have somebody that does what, uh, what I did as a child. That is that you go up there and you want to hit a home run every time you're up there. And so you have a very loose grip on your bat. And of course, you let go of that bat every single time you swing. And I had a coach that sat me down one time and said, now listen, Ryan, I want to tell you this. If you keep throwing that bat, somebody's going to get hurt, and I'm not going to play you if you keep throwing that bat. So I had to make sure that I had a firm grip on the bat when I was going to swing and try to hit the ball. You see, Paul was telling Timothy that he needs to have a firm grip on the things that he taught him because if he doesn't, he himself is going to get spiritually hurt, and he's also going to hurt other people with false teachings. And so he says there to follow, but he says to follow the pattern of the sound words. And that word pattern means a model or an example. Timothy was not to make up his own teachings. He was not to add to it or to take away from it. He was to know the teachings and then to teach other people the word of God as well. That's what it means by to follow the pattern. But the word for sound means healthy. The gospel makes spiritually people, spiritually sick people, whole in Christ. Truth produces health. It results in right thinking and godly behavior. Sound doctrine always leads to holy living. And so if you're here today and you're not living a holy life, it's because you are not investing your life and applying God's word, knowing God's word, and applying it to your life. So that's why Paul tells Timothy, he's telling us today to follow that pattern of sound words. In other words, study the scriptures. Make sure you know the scriptures very well because it is extremely important as we are trying to be men and women of uncompromising convictions. But not only do we study the convictions, we also listen to the scriptures. In verse 13, he continues there, follow the pattern of sound words that you have heard from me. And so Timothy had to hear the words that Paul was teaching him. He had to put himself in an atmosphere where he was learning what God had to say. Paul taught Timothy sound doctrine so that Timothy could live and promote godly life through it. So how do we listen to the scriptures? Well, we don't need to listen to the scriptures merely for enlightenment. Somebody that listens for enlightenment just only listens for things that they didn't know before. So they sit down and listen and say, preacher, tell me something I didn't know before. And so I didn't know that. So that, that was a good sermon. You taught me something I didn't know. But if you're merely seeking knowledge, you can block out a sermon or a text you're reading because you might say, oh, I've heard all that before. I'm not going to pay attention to the rest. Some people listen to the scriptures for entertainment. They might would say to the preacher or somebody else, I like that passage or I like that sermon, but there are times where the word of God is going to present something that we don't like. It might step on our toes with steel-toed boots, right? And there are times it makes us feel really small. It's what we need, but we don't always like to receive it. And so if you come here today and you're like, I love to be entertained, I just, just make me feel good about myself, you're sometimes not going to get that feeling. In fact, the Bible says that uh, Herod used to listen to John the Baptist for entertainment purposes. He loved to hear John the Baptist preach. Of course, later on, he would take off John the Baptist's head, but at least for a while, he was entertained by him. Entertainment and enlightenment, these are not good reasons to listen to the scriptures. What are some good reasons? Examination is one of them, where we allow the word of God to examine our hearts and the Holy Spirit to move and to reveal to us Areas where we're not pleasing to God. And so the word of God is like a mirror. It shows us the truth about our hearts. 
And sometimes we might see the truth and we say, I don't like that. I'm going to turn that mirror on somebody else. But nonetheless, it is a good reason for us to study Scripture. Is my life pleasing to God? One way we know is we study the Scriptures. We listen to it. Another good reason is encouragement or edification. So as you listen to the Word of God, you think about these questions. Am I growing? What do I need to do? What does God want me to do? You see, an honest look into the Scriptures produces convictions that shape who you are and what you stand for. So as we listen to the Word of God, we come before God and we say, God, I am like clay in your hands. Mold me and form me into who you want me to be so that I make decisions that are pleasing to you, so that my mind is thinking on thoughts that are pleasing to you, so I stay away from behaviors that are not pleasing to you. Encouragement, edification, examination, those are all good reasons to listen to the word, ways to listen to the word. So what does this mean practically? What are ways we can listen to the word practically? Well, I think it starts with having a consistent, regular attendance at church. That's a very important thing where you put yourself in a surrounding to hear the preached word and the taught word in your Sunday school classes, where you come eager to learn, eager to grow, eager to hear what God is saying to your heart. If you are quick to make excuses about not coming, well, it's 68 degrees outside and, you know, it's too pretty to come. Well, it's 67 degrees, it's too cold to come. If if that's kind of your attitude, you're going to always find an excuse not to come. And so I encourage you to make coming to church a priority. But not only that, we talked about getting involved in small groups, Sunday school classes, discipleship groups. Think about this. Are you actively seeking opportunities to learn about God and to know his word? Are you actively listening to the word of God being preached? I had a church member one time tell me that that when I preach, it's the best 45-minute nap he gets all week. Well, he wasn't actively engaged in the word of God. And and if your neighbor is sitting next to you starting to doze off, say, hey, God's going to speak to you here today. So, so encourage them to listen to the word. What about during your quiet time? When you have your quiet time, are you just rushing through it to check a box? Or are you spending unhurried time in the word to be able to know him, to grow in him? It is so very important. That's what it means to listen to the scriptures. Here's the thing. Your flesh is going to oppose you on these things. Your flesh does not want you to please God. So you're going to continually come up with a million excuses why you should not come to church, why you should not come to Sunday school, why you should not have a quiet time. You're going to be bombarded with excuses all the time. But you have to step back and say this, I have a conviction, a strong, uncompromising conviction that I want to deepen my walk with Jesus and please him in my life. And because of that, I'm not going to listen to those excuses. The word can become your delight when your heart is changed. If you have a hardened heart where Monday through Saturday you walk in sin, you don't spend any time in prayer, you don't spend any time in Bible study, and you come to church and you have an attitude like, all right, God, good luck with this, If that's kind of what your attitude is, you you know, you're really setting yourself up to fail. Instead, we need to come walking in the Lord so that God's word becomes our delight. We look forward to hear from the word of God. God, here's my heart. What do you have to say to me? We're looking forward to that. And again, I want to say this over and over again. If your approach to the word of God is shaky and you have a very weak foundation there, you will find a million reasons to be ashamed of the gospel, a million reasons to be fearful of the gospel, and you are always going to live in a way that protects your conveniences and protects your safety. That's what your life is all about. But Paul has told Timothy, be unashamed, be fearless, have strong convictions, and he's telling us the same thing today as well. But there's a third way that we can develop deep convictions Not only to study the scriptures and listen, but we also obey the scriptures. So what does obeying the scriptures look like? You can see it there in verse 13. In the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. So you're going to grow in the way you trust Jesus, in the way that you love Jesus and love others. So we guard the gospel by how we live. James, we studied uh, several months ago, and in the book of James we were told that faith without works is dead, right? 
Active faith always produces works. Well, what are these works? Things that are done out of a love for God, things that are done out of a love for other people. Those are works. And so in other words, if you have a genuine faith, you're going to do things out of love for God and out of love for others. The reason why you check on people and you you encourage people is because you love them. The reason why you worship, the reason why you pray, the reason why you spend time in the word of God is because you love God. It's all about that love. Genuine faith produces actions. We must proclaim the truth in love, not high pressure, number hungry manipulation. We must be kind and compassionate. This only comes from people, as the Bible says here, that are in Christ Jesus. This is not something we can manufacture, something we can fake. It comes by being saved and by walking in the light. And so you have to examine yourself. You will not have a strong conviction if you're not walking in the light. So how much of a priority is it for you to please Jesus with your life? But where do we find the strength to stand for the gospel in the face of suffering? And where to protect it from those who are false teachers? Does it come by trying will real hard, by having willpower? Is that where it comes from? No. Actually, Paul tells us exactly where we can get this power, that we depend on the power of the Holy Spirit. This is our second thought today, ways that we can have uncompromising convictions in our life. Not only do we develop and deepen our conviction about the Word of God by reading it and studying it, listening to it and obeying it, but we also need to get to the point where we depend on the Holy Spirit's power each and every day. Paul knew that Timothy could do this, not because he knew Timothy had a lot of great abilities, but because he knew the Holy Spirit was in his life. Oswald Chambers said this quote. It's kind of a famous quote. Maybe you've heard it before. He said, all through history, God has chosen and used nobodies because their unusual dependence on him made possible the unique display of his power and grace. He chose and used somebodies only when they renounce dependence on their natural abilities and their resources. And so God is looking for a few good nobodies, right? People who know they, they cannot succeed in ministry without God's strength. As the Casting Crown song says, I'm just a nobody trying to tell everybody about somebody who saved my soul. And it goes on to say, I'm living for the whole world to see Nobody but Jesus. So we're not alone. The Holy Spirit helps believers to keep and to guard the word of God. So what do we do? We admit on our own we have no strength. We need the Holy Spirit's strength in order to do this. Apart from his ministry, we're in the dark when it comes to understanding the word of God. Apart from him, we're going to approach the word of God as though it's some historical book or some book that gives inspirational stories or some religious textbook that just gives recommendations on how I'm supposed to live. That's how we're going to approach the word of God if we don't have the Holy Spirit. And many people think of themselves as unworthy to live out the Christian life. But it is the Holy Spirit within them that makes them able to do that. So church, stop being ashamed. Stop being fearful. God has a plan and purpose for your life. He's given you the Spirit to do it. So I want to give you two biblical truths about this Holy Spirit. Every believer has the Spirit, and here are two truths about him. Number one, the Holy Spirit indwells every believer. The Holy Spirit indwells believers. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, it says in verse 16, Do you not know that you are God's temple, and that God's Spirit dwells in you? And then in Romans 8, 9, it says, You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. And so, if you are saved, the Holy Spirit indwells within you. In other words, you have that power within you to do what God wants you to do. To guard the gospel message, to keep the gospel message, to be obedient to Jesus. And so, if you step back and say, well, I just, I'm just addicted to something. I can't stop doing that behavior. Paul says, no, you have the Holy Spirit inside of you. 
that same Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives inside of you. You can overcome it, but not by your own power. It requires the power of the Spirit. Secondly, not only does the Spirit indwell believers, but the Spirit also empowers believers. The Bible tells us in Acts 1.8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So the Holy Spirit gives us that power to be able to perform tasks for the glory of God the Father. It's not our power or our talents. We accomplish God's mission through the power of God's Spirit. So what does this mean? It means to depend upon him. Yield yourself to him. Every day, have a funeral where you say, I'm not going to live today for myself. I'm denying myself, and I'm yielding myself to you. Holy Spirit, fill me so that I can live today in a way that's pleasing to God. You cannot do this on your own. Don't make yourself somebody when we need to be nobody that's filled with the Spirit. Point number three, as we're moving forward here, how to have uncompromising convictions. We've seen so far the importance of deepening our convictions about the Word of God and and depending on the Holy Spirit. But there's a third way that we can grow in our convictions. It is this, that we develop relationships for the gospel. So I want to read verse 15 to you here. And let me just ask you, as I'm reading this, try to get the tone in Paul's voice as he writes this. Do you think he's happy or do you think he's sad As we read verse 15, it says this, You are aware that all who are in Asia turned away from me, among whom are Phygelus and Hermogenes. You see, Paul's not happy when he writes those words. You can hear the pain and the hurt in Paul's voice. You see, people that you do not know cannot hurt you as badly as the people that you do know. Hurt comes when you have known people and you love them, and you invest in them. That's why the people that are closest to you are the people that can hurt you the most. C.S. Lewis one time said, to love at all is to be vulnerable. If you don't want to be hurt, give yourself to no one, not even a cat. But here's the thing. Ministry is about giving yourself away. We're not called to be hermits that constantly live our lives protecting our feelings and protecting ourselves from hurt. This is an important conviction. Again, we don't seek to get hurt, but we understand that when we love people, that there is a possibility that they can hurt us because we love them. There is a consequence to loving people sometimes. Paul understood that the gospel impacted all areas of his life. So any relationship that he developed was for the sake of the gospel. If he met somebody that was lost, he would try to win that person to Jesus. If he met somebody that was immature in their faith, he would try to help them to grow in Jesus. If he met somebody that was more mature than him, he wanted to emulate and learn from that person. It was all about the gospel. Everybody that he knew, it was all about the gospel. So he loved He loved Jesus, and by loving Jesus, he loved people. And so here's what I want you to see here today, that just like Paul, you're going to meet two types of people. You're going to meet people with a false faith, and you're going to meet people with real, genuine faith. And so let's look first at those people with a false faith. These people with false faith, they live selfishly. They live selfishly. In verse 15, it speaks about Phygelus, it speaks about Hermogenes and and all the people in Asia, probably some hyperbole here, saying it seems like everybody in Asia is leaving me. I'm here in a dark prison cell, and I'm lonely, and I'm all alone, and he's just pouring out his heart to Timothy, and he's saying, I don't want you to be like them. I don't want you to be like them. We don't know why these people turned away. It probably had to do with their own personal agenda. If you have a selfish reason in a relationship, you won't stick around when that person has a genuine need. So people fall away from the faith for usually one of three reasons. Reason one is because there was some false doctrine that came into their life. Reason two, it might be that they started living for the world. And reason three, they had a fear of persecution. 
And it might have been any one of those reasons, particularly the third one. These men inevitably did not want to go through any per- possible persecution that might incur by their knowing Paul. And so they might have followed Paul up to a point, when, but when they see Paul getting thrown in jail, they turn and scatter. I don't want to have anything to do with that Paul then. And Paul's sitting in jail wondering where Phygelus is, wondering where Hermogenes is, wondering where all the people in Asia are because he is all alone. People scattered. They were not loyal. They were ashamed of the gospel and ashamed of God's servant. We have to be careful that we, when, whenever we surround ourselves with people who only love themselves. Their shame for the gospel can lead us to also be ashamed of the gospel as well. And maybe you've seen this in your own life, where you might hang around certain people and before long you start talking the way that they talk and even doing the things that you do. And you might have had good intentions thinking, I'm going to impact this person, but before long you're doing the things that they're doing and they're impacting you more than they are getting impacted by you. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 33, do not be deceived, bad company corrupts good morals. And so if we meet people that have a fake faith, these people are going to live selfishly, but Paul says, I'm going to love them anyway, but it might end up hurting me. But for the sake of the gospel, I'm going to keep on loving because you don't know who's going to hurt you and who's going to be somebody that edifies you, which leads us to this second thought here, people with real faith. You see, people with fake faith, they live selfishly, but if you have a real faith, you're going to live mercifully. And you live mercifully because you've experienced the mercy of Jesus. You know that he is kind and good and gracious. He reached out to you and gave you what you did not deserve, and so you reach out to others and show the love of Christ. You give them mercy. And so Paul's telling Timothy, don't be like Hermogenes, don't be like Phygelus, don't be like all of Asia, but instead, Timothy, be like our brother Onesiphorus. He was unashamed of the gospel. He was a loyal support and a loyal friend to Paul. He encouraged Paul during his travels. His family must have shown hospitality to him while he was in Ephesus and provided shelter and food for him. And in verse 17, you see that Onesiphorus had no fear or shame. His search involved considerable time, effort, and even risk to his own life. But instead of excuses, what do we see Onesiphorus doing? He is extending mercy and compassion. You see, he demonstrated his true faith by going to the least of these. He went to somebody that was in prison. Why would Onesiphorus do this? It was to no benefit to him. But he did it because he loved Paul. You see how that works? When you love somebody, you do things, even if it means you don't get something from it. That's what Onesiphorus does. And so what Paul does is he turns around and says that, may he who found me find mercy in the Lord. I pray God's blessing would be upon Onesiphorus and his family because he was a great blessing to me. Church, listen to me. As you hang out with spiritually courageous Christians, it will strengthen your walk with the Lord. If you look around your circle of friends and every single one of them is ashamed of the gospel or they're unbelievers or they live in a way that is fearful of the gospel, you are going to be affected by that. But if you live by people that are walking with Jesus, that have unashamed conviction about the word of God, that are depending upon the Holy Spirit, that are building relationships for the purpose of the kingdom, if those are the people that you're walking around, those are the people you're hanging around with, it will positively affect you where you're going to be unashamed of the gospel because you see that God is with your friend. He's going to be with you as well. So those people are gifts of grace. So whether false faith or real faith, our conviction is to love people. By loving people, yes, they might hurt you, and maybe they they will edify you and encourage you, but the point of the gospel is that we pour out our lives. We give ourselves over and over and over again. Why in the world would we do that? Because that's what Jesus has done for us. You see that? We give because he is given. We're merciful because he is merciful. We love because he loves. Sometimes that means we get hurt. But the bottom line is, is that God gives us what we need when we need it. And God's going to take care of the rest. 
It's not our job to get vengeance on people who hurt us. We leave that in God's hands, don't we? And so today, we are looking at uncompromising convictions. And I've listed three for you today. Where do you stand on this? Have you deepened your conviction about God's word? Are you depending upon the power of the Holy Spirit? And are you developing relationships for the sake of the gospel? These are things that will help you to grow and be someone that is uncompromising in your faith. Knowing that even when hard times come, you are going to stand firm. No matter when the wind blows, trials come in your life, you love Jesus. Jesus has done nothing but been faithful to you. These convictions keep you strong. And so Paul was telling Timothy, hold firm to these convictions. Hold firm to healthy and sound words because those healthy doctrines produce healthy living, produce healthy thinking, and it will have a great impact where you're ministering. Church, this is a timely word for us today, and I'm encouraging you to recognize what you believe matters. What you believe matters. Don't go through life going through motions, not thinking about why you believe what you believe, but believe it firmly as it is the word of God, as you depend on the power of the Holy Spirit, and as you develop relationships for the sake of the gospel. So at this time, I want to invite our musicians and counselors to come to their places. In a moment, we're going to have a time of response And during this time of response, you're going to have an opportunity to respond however God is speaking to your heart. And we've been praying that you would. We've been praying that God would open your heart to come and to be obedient to whatever he's asking you to do. But a conviction is a strong belief in something that leads to action. But today, it's not about something. It's about someone. And so what about your faith has ever led to action? That's an important thing to consider. So let me ask you a few questions here today as we're getting to this point of response. Are you constantly excusing your disobedience? Is that something that you are doing? Do you find yourself constantly compromising your faith in order to protect yourself? Or is your relationship with Jesus merely something that you do on Sunday? If you answered that, yeah, those things are true about me, I want you to see clearly here that Jesus is not sitting on the throne of your heart. You're sitting on the throne of your heart. You are the one that's in control. You're making decisions for yourself. You're not allowing Jesus or the word of God to direct or control your life. And it sounds like you've never truly surrendered to Jesus as boss and Lord of your life. If you've never done that, you're always going to be ashamed of the gospel. You're always going to be fearful whenever there's something that's going to take you out of a comfort zone, take you out of convenience, take you out of having a reputation like you like to have. But when you follow Jesus, you say, I'm leaving all that behind, and I'm going to just follow you, God. I'm going to trust you. And So if you never surrender to Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, today's the day that you can do that. If you have lived your life, maybe you've been in church your entire life, but you've never surrendered, today you can still do that. You might say, well, I'm concerned about what everybody else will think about me. They always thought I was a Christian. They always thought I was a good person. Listen to me. What God thinks about you is the most important thing. And I'll tell you what everybody in here is going to think. We're going to rejoice. We're going to be excited for you. And so today, if you've never surrendered your life to Christ, it's not necessarily just about What you believe, that's important, but it's about who you believe. You see, there are a lot of people who know about Jesus, but they don't know him. They know all the right things to say, but they aren't living their life as though they've met him. When you have Jesus in your life, he changes you. There's a transformation that's taken place. You desire God's word. You want to be around God's people. You want to live unashamed. You want to live fearless for the gospel. If that's not you here today, the call is for you to surrender. So let's all bow our heads and hearts at this time. If you're not a true believer in Jesus today, it is exhausting being a different person everywhere you go. 
And maybe you're just sick and tired of being sick and tired, trying something, trying new things every week to try to find fulfillment, to try to find the answers to that void in your heart. Jesus has come for you. And I want to invite you today, if you've never asked Jesus to save you and really meant it, where you surrender your life to repeat after me, dear Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I know that my sin separates me from you. I know I don't deserve your love. I don't deserve your grace. But I know that you are a God who loves me and a God who wants to give me grace. And I know that because you sent Jesus to die on the cross for my sins. I believe that. And I believe that Jesus rose from the dead. So Jesus, come into my life. I'm tired of pretending. I'm tired of going through motions. I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. I'm tired of running into things that I think are going to help me, only to leave me empty. Jesus, save me. Change my life. Help me to be unashamed of the gospel. Help me to live fearlessly for you. I'm turning my life from me to you. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to have a time of response, and the musicians are going to play. In a moment, we're going to stand. But if you prayed that prayer and meant it from your heart, I want to invite you to come down this aisle and share that with us. And we're going to rejoice with you, no matter what your background is. For others of you here today, maybe there's a huge burden on your heart. You need to come to the altar and pray for it. Maybe you need to pray for somebody. That's what this time is for. It might be that you have questions about membership or baptism. You can come forward and you can ask those questions as well. This time of response is a time for you to respond to how God has spoken to your heart. So what's God doing in your heart today? Let's all stand together as we have this time of response. Be obedient to Jesus. Trust him. Obey him. And come to Jesus.
may be seated. Well, God bless you for being here and for your attention to the Word of God. I pray that we develop those uncompromising convictions to reach our world around us. The world needs Jesus, and it needs Christians who will stand up and stand firm for what they believe in. And so it's my encouragement that you would continue to do those things. You might have noticed in, with, with the worship guide that there are several announcements that are there. I, I'm not going to take time to go over all of them, but just a few important things. To begin with, uh, next week, the 12th of February, we have the special opportunity to vote on our high school youth minister, and looking forward to Brother Drew Hall. Drew, why don't you just uh, stand for everybody and just wave so if they, if they don't know who you are. There he is. <laughs> Excited about what God's going to do through that. That vote will be next Sunday, so please be sure to take note of that. Also, we are having our quarterly business meeting today at 4 p.m. It will be in the youth room, a little bit of a different location, but I promise you, you can still do business in the youth room. As it turns out, the church did business there for many years there. So, so we can still do that, uh, and it will be okay. Four o'clock, please come. We need you there to keep you informed and to uh, just be an encouragement to one another. All right, and so with that, I don't have any other announcements. Don't forget about what's going on tonight. We do have our Celebrate Recovery ministry, as well as the Senior Adult Ministry, all of that starting at 5 o'clock. Is there another word about anything else? I hear some noises. Yes, okay, Miss Ada. All right, so a Valentine event, 1130 on Wednesday. See Ada if you're interested in that. And then the ARC trip, which is going to be taken in March. See her if you're interested in going to the ARC. All right, anybody else have a word? I thought I saw something. Yes. Okay. Okay, so the women t-shirts are in, as well as the opportunity to go on the women's retreat this weekend. See Cassie for more information. Anybody else have anything? All right. Well, God bless you for being here. Have a wonderful afternoon. Guests, come by and introduce yourself to me if I haven't had a chance to meet you. So glad that you're here. Let's all stand together and sing out, giving praise to him.